Good morning. Welcome to worship today. For those of you joining us online, we are glad that you are with us. And uh, we have a kids cheering section here today, right? Anybody else want to join them? Less? It seems like your speed over here. Yeah. <laughs> we are glad that you're with us as we gather here to worship God and to bring ourselves before him as we enter his presence that is already among us and we uh, come and bring ourselves into the presence of God in order to humble ourselves and to worship him. So please join me in our call to worship as we uh, read together in unison Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. Gracious and holy God, we pray that you'd fill this place with your Spirit. That as we come into this sanctuary, that we would encounter the God who is with us. The God whose presence is among us. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth with all that we are among the fear and, and doubts and worry and tension of this life and of this culture right now. We know that you are a God who holds all things in his hands. May we trust forever in that presence that is with us. And may we worship you with all that we are. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's stand together and sing hymn number 450, Lift High the Cross and Speak, O Lord.
Friends, the gospel reminds us and teaches us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is where we put our hope, our faith, and our trust. Let us join together in our prayer of confession as we confess our sins before one another and more importantly before God. Please join me. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. That as far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our, your transgressions from you. Know this and be at peace. Believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to, while you're all already here, getting ready for our children's sermon, if uh, the other couple want to come forward. We're glad that you're with us today as we have a few announcements to make. Uh, summer worship is going, uh, we're taking the summer worship reservations, but as we're kind of looking out towards the future and sort of how things are going pandemic-wise, we're, we're kind of settling in that this is going to be our model for a while. Uh, the session is going to reconvene in the beginning of September, but just plan at 9 and 11 o'clock online. We're going to keep doing that as things continue, and as, as uh, many of you already know, we haven't seen any spikes or transmissions here in the church, and so we feel good about where we are and what's going on, but just kind of buckle up, because I think this is going to be the plan for a while. There will be a break in that plan, and that August 31st, we are going to be worshiping outdoors. We purchased uh, an outdoor sound system uh, that we're going to use from this platform over here. Bring your own chair, and we're going to have a tailgate-like uh, picnic uh, for, for our picnic Sunday this year. So we're still going to be doing it, but it's bring your own chair, bring your own food, and we're going to spread out. So we'll be able to wave to people from where we are, but um, we're going to be doing all of that outdoors August 30th at 10 a.m. Uh, so plan for rain because we know that that is what is going to happen uh, now that we have this plan in place. So we'll let you know what our... our uh... Hey, man. What's up? Oh, yeah, over there. So we'll let you know what, uh, what the rain plans are going to be. Um, we're, I, I'm also going to start something here this week. Uh, we're going to be doing what we're, we're going to call them driveway visits. You can schedule a visit with me. I've blocked out time on my schedule. Lori has those uh, block times and can schedule for you. So you can call the church office or you can email me. Uh, and we will... Um, can you wave to the camera? Yeah. So we will... Uh, and I'll come out and visit you. We'll be doing it outdoors, please. Uh, driveway visit on your porch or something. I'll bring my own chair. There'll be distant visits. But those of you that are, are uh, in need or if you know someone in need of a pastoral visit, I'd be happy to do that. And it could be anybody. You don't even have to have a need. If you just want to hang out and talk, I'm happy to do that too. So uh, you can schedule that. I can't call everybody in the church and see who wants it. So you're going to have to call and schedule, but we'll be happy to come out and visit you. Uh, we also want to extend our sympathy to the McCanns, uh, Doug, Lori's husband. Uh, his mom passed away last week, and so please be in prayer for them as uh, they mourn her passing. And I think that is it. For all of you that um, gave your time and energy and talents to VBS this week, we thank you for this 
unique challenge that we face as an all outdoor VBS, but it went very well. And finally, actually, I do have one more announcement. Uh, Ralph Morrison, as many of you remember, a long time a beloved member of our church, passed away just before the lockdowns. We are having his memorial service here on Saturday. It is a closed family only service, but we also will be live streaming it online at 11 o'clock on our website. So Saturday at 11 will be the memorial service for Ralph Morrison, for those of you who knew him and want to celebrate his life. We hope you'll join us. Go ahead. Morning. What are you doing up here, bud? What do you think? JD, what's a gift of yours? What's something you do really well? Baseball. Baseball? Yeah, absolutely. You're a pretty good af- athlete. And do you share that gift? Absolutely, because you go out and play, right? And you share that with your team, and your team is better with you. And that's something that you share with your friends and, and share with your team. If you didn't share that gift... Wouldn't your team miss you? Absolutely. So I have an item here this morning, and you guys should all be familiar because every single one of you came to Vacation Bible School this week. What do we have right here? A frisbee. A frisbee, which is made out of what? Plastic. Plastic. And isn't it boring? Is it boring? No. No? Oh, good. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it this week. But in the great scheme of toys... And all, think about all the toys you have at home. Is a Frisbee the most high-tech and awesome, amazing thing you have in your house? No, probably not. It's not an RC car, and it's not some really cool Lego set, and it's not you can't build it and take it apart and put it back together. It's just not a really big, crazy toy. But just like this Frisbee, you and I can do big things. Did you know this Frisbee, and you know this from experience, that Frisbees can fly. Frisbees can take off, right, J.D.? Pretty cool, huh? And all of a sudden, that plain plate or flat object is pretty cool. It's something that you can take out in the yard and play with because it does something really cool that you don't necessarily can tell when you first have it But once you use it, once you see it being used, it becomes a really fun and joyful thing, right? So if we use our gifts, we can share that with others, and that becomes a joy. It's a way to express God's love. So next time you see a Frisbee, remember, just like that Frisbee, we can look kind of plain on the inside, but once we share our talents and our gifts that God gives us, we become pretty special. Amen. Hey, we're going to... Um, so our friend Molly and Sa- our friends Molly and Sadie are singing today. So why don't you guys hang around and watch them sing? What do you think? All right, we'll do that. Is there any, are there any prayer requests for this morning? Okay. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we praise you for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We know that we are yours, that we are uh, made in your image and that we belong to you, your servant. And then we come into this place, we worship you and adore you, for your graciousness and your holiness. And God, we, we know that you are the God of all things. You hold all things in your hand. And we trust in that. We thank you for this week of VBS, of, of joy, of song, of singing, of teaching, of learning and of giving our lives to you, of learning to trust in you and you alone. We pray for Doug and Lori McCann as they mourn the loss of Doug's mother, and we pray that you would give them a spirit of comfort and a peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And as we take a moment to pray silently before you, Father, we ask you to hear those unspoken prayers of our hearts.
Father, give us a heart for our community and for those around us. Give us a heart to invest the gifts that we've been given for the joy of the kingdom and not just for ourselves. That we've not just been called away from something, but that we've been called to something, to serve and to love in your name. May we be willing to take the risk for the sake of the kingdom. And we pray that in this moment, in this season, and in this time where we're, we're being driven by fear and by worry and anxiety, that we put our hope and trust in you and you alone. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, reading verses 4 through 6. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning, and in the evening let your hands not be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. She said, you're welcome. (laughs) Anytime, right, Molly? Yeah. Good morning. It is good to be back in the pulpit. I got a little preacher with me today, huh? You just going to stick around? You want to stay for the service? You can't see it online. The little twin is climbing up the steps. So see you later, guys. It is good to be back. Last week we were finishing up our vacation on Lake Erie. It was uh, one of the first times ever in my life that 
I did not want to come back from vacation. I think many of us feel that way about the world in which we are in right now. It's nobody's fault. It's not like I don't love the church or something. I was just tired, and it was nice to be away and not think about or be bombarded by the news or how terrible the world is, right? And so, uh, but it is good to be back, and, and it is good to be back in the pulpit, away from vacation. But the, I think the other reason I didn't want to come back, there's, I, I'm here for a while. Like, there's nothing else to look forward to. So we're just back to work and back at the work of the gospel. But that is our calling for all of us, isn't it? The work of the gospel. We've been uh, going through this series this summer on the parables, the stories that Jesus tells that teach us about the kingdom of God. And we've been calling it the keys to the kingdom because Jesus gives us those secrets. He tells us what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is this. The kingdom of God is that. And it challenges us deeply as the church on what it means for us to live as faithful followers of Jesus. And part of that, a part of being in the kingdom, is risk-taking. All that we have, God gives us these great and grand gifts. But how do we use those gifts? And the parable that we're about to read, which is the, it's been typically known as the parable of the talents, but new translations are, use, are calling it the parable of the bags of gold, is sandwiched between two other parables. The first one in chapter 25 tells us about the parable of the ten virgins, that they are waiting for the bridegroom, But some of them are prepared and some are not. So when the bridegroom comes, those that are prepared are ready to go, but those that are not are left behind. So in uh, the next one, or the third one, the one at the bottom of chapter 25, is a parable about the sheep and the goats. That the sheep and goats come to the shepherd, and the sheep go to the right, and the goats go to the left, and the sheep go with the shepherd, and the goats are left behind. Some of people will read chapter 25 of the Gospel of Matthew and go, man, Jesus is mean. He's full of condemnation. But that's not the point of the parables. The point of the parables is not to condemn. The point of the parables is to warn because there's a constant theme throughout. These are those who claim to know the shepherd. And we'll see that in the parable of the talents. It's a warning. How are we using what God has given us before that judgment day comes? We open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, reading verses 14 through 30. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and trusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. 
Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray this morning that you would write your word on our hearts. That we would accept the challenge to use the gifts that you've given for the glory of your holy name. May we be faithful with what you have entrusted to us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Laura and I have uh, just finished up the documentary on Michael Jordan, The Last Dance, which is not about dancing, it is about basketball. And The Last Dance was a documentary that Jordan made of himself. So that gives you a little idea of who Michael Jordan really is. He made this documentary about his own life and the last season of the 19, uh, that he had with the 1998 Chicago Bulls and how it all the dynasty all fell apart. It's fascinating when it comes to sports documentaries. Jordan is known and arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, basketball player of all time. And most people aren't even willing to discuss it, that he is the greatest, hands down, not even a question. But you know, Jordan's greatness wasn't always well known. There's this uh, legacy, this myth, and we do this, by the way, with uh, athletes and, and this myth, we, they, come, they become these like mythical creatures and we tell these stories that aren't necessarily true. I remember when I was in uh, middle school, a young a friend of mine, uh, we were I think eighth grade, got cut from the basketball team. And I remember somebody saying to him, well Michael Jordan got cut from his team when he was in eighth grade, you know, sorry buddy, you're not Michael Jordan. Uh, but that's the sort of the myth, the legacy. He, he just didn't make the varsity team. So he didn't get cut from the basketball team. But it kind of, he used that to drive him to greatness. And you see that in the documentary. He takes all of these these kind of things, and in some cases he admits that he made up stories about other players or other teams to drive and fuel him towards greatness. Jordan was great. Jordan was athletically gifted, and made something that most of us were not made to be, right? We are not 6'6", 220-pound basketball players. But Jordan's greatness wasn't always evident. He wasn't even the number one pick when he came out of college at North Carolina. But he goes on to be a six-time champion, five-time MVP, first ballot Hall of Famer. Why is that? And that, that is an honest question. Why is it? Because he was given this gift right? An ability that most of us could only dream of. But to him, the gift was something to be used, something to be invested. And he had this drive that set him apart. And other great athletes, I know this is blasphemy here, but Tom Brady's one of them, right? Or Kobe Bryant. They're, they're athletically gifted beyond our recognition, beyond anything we can comprehend. But they have something extra. Because there's plenty of athletes who don't make it, right? But they have this drive to use what they have to the best of their ability to achieve great things. And I think, personally, it's one of my great struggles in the culture that we live in right now, in the world that we're a part of. Because we we live in sort of, it's it's not sort of, it is. It's this instant culture. And we, we want the rewards without the work, right? We want to get to the mountaintop without having to climb the mountain. Just the helicopter can just drop me off at the top. I just want the views. I don't, I don't really want to do the work, the hard work of climbing the mountain. Right? We, we want the medals without the actual work it takes to get there. And, and so we live in this culture, in this time, where really the question we're asking is, what can, what can I get? What can you do for me? When, when people join churches today, This is not a joke. I deal with this with my friends all the time. Young families joining churches today, the questions they're asking of us as pastors is, what do you have for me? That's the question. 
It's the driving question in our politics. Pay attention to our politics, right? And, and we're equal opportunity haters here on the po- politics end. But right and left, they do the same thing. If you can sift through all the fear-mongering that's happening right now in our political debates and discussions, pay attention. Because they're not asking this question, this grander question of uh, a community or, or, or you know, what we are going to become. They're, they're promising us things. What can I get out of it? Because that's the driving question of the American soul. What, what will I get? Not that 60 years ago, somebody we all know, John F. Kennedy Jr., gave a speech. And in that famous speech, he gave a line. And you all know what I'm about to say. I wasn't even alive. I wasn't even a glimmer in my parents. I, my parents were 12 years old when this happened, right? But the, the line is, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I, I don't see any politicians asking that question <laughs> anymore, right? Because it's not what we want to know. What we want to know is, what can you do for me? Because we have this protectionist ideal in this consumer culture that we live in. Give me, feed me, protect what is mine. So we want to hold on. If you want to know the root of the division and tension and all that's happening in our culture, it's because people are trying to get what they think they deserve, what is theirs or what they think is owed to them, and that's across the lines. That's everyone. That's how our culture is operating and driving. And, and this cultural commentary is driving us into fear, and it's driving us into protection, protectionism. That we're taking what is ours, and we're holding on to it, and we're hoarding it, and we're saying, it's mine, don't take it from me. Right? And so this way of living in this culture that we're in has actually made us, ironically, very risk-adverse. In our lives, in in the culture, and in the church. We don't want to take risks. I I, I, um, hear this all the time as a pastor in in our leadership. We we have these conversations all the time. Uh, Our leadership constantly says, well, it's not that I'm against risk. I just want calculated risk. And really what we mean by that is, well, we want assured risk, as if that's something that exists. It doesn't, by the way. Risk inevitably comes along with the possibility of loss, and that's truly what we're afraid of. Truly what we're afraid of is loss. What will we lose if we take the risk, that's the question. So we, we do this as Presbyterians, by the way. Presbyterians are really great at this. Right? We have an idea, or somebody's got a plan. And, and we're going through this. We have a church plant that's happening down in Mars, right? And, and it's like he's got to be vetted by 18 different places and people to make sure it's not going to fail. It might. We've got to live with that. Right? I was in a meeting the other day telling people, we've got to live with the possibility that it might fail. But it's the risk we have to take. We don't like that. We want to form committees. We want to get all the the invested players to make sure that none of them are going to be happy because we don't want to lose people and we don't want to lose money and we don't want to lose face. So we've got to do committees and run it through the proper channels and everybody's got to stamp their approval on it. And we're willing generally to just throw it out the window if just one person stands up and says, well, I I don't think we should do this. Right? And, and I, this is not a, on all of you. I'm the pastor of the church. I do it too. Because we, we are risk adverse. Why are we risk adverse? Because we like where we are. We like what we've become. We're comfortable with what it is. So nobody goes all in when they're really comfortable with what they have, right? Most of us would say, well, that is an unwise risk to take to go all in and, and risk losing it all when you have so much. Why would you do that? Just take mitigated risk, calculated risk. Be willing to lose maybe a little bit, but not that much. And if, you're, if you can promise that if we lose just a little bit, but not that much, then we're, we might be willing to get on board. But what that actually makes us is risk adverse. And being risk adverse, ironically, is not a biblical call of being the church. That God gives to us generally, but generously, but that generosity actually requires something more of us. 
that when we've been, to, that, that's an old proverb, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so God's gracious and generous gifts to us actually put on us a responsibility to do the work of the kingdom. But we like what we are. We like what we've become. We like what we have. And we don't want to risk losing it. And so we just stay the course. And we think our faithfulness is measured by staying the course and mitigating loss. It's true. We think faithfulness in the church is measured by mitigating loss and staying the course. But the gospel calls us to something entirely different. That risk-taking is inherent in being the church because discipleship is inherently risk-taking. Mission is risk-taking. It has to be. It has to be. And that's what the parable of the bags of gold, the parable of the talents, is really about. At the beginning of chapter 25, and in the first parable that we didn't read, but it, Jesus began that parable with the ten virgins, and he says, the kingdom of God will be like. So he's, it's this promise of what the kingdom's going to be on that judgment day, on the day that Jesus returns, or on that day that we meet Jesus face to face. So the kingdom of God will be like this. And the parable that we read today, starting in verse 14, begins with, again, the kingdom of heaven will be. So he's building on this idea of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be on the return. He's talking about the return of Jesus or that judgment day for each and every one of us when we meet God face to face. What is that going to be? And, but the, the great thing about this parable is it actually gives us this warning. You have an opportunity, is what Jesus is saying. And so in this parable, the, the master or the owner who has an abundant wealth calls his servants to him. And that's such a key part of this parable. He calls his servants to him. So these are his own. They are known by the master, and the mas they know the master. It's both ways. The parable. The parable is just not the world out there. It's not some random people who don't belong or don't believe. The parable is about the church. The parable is about you and me. Right? Because the master has called his servants, those that belong to him, to him. It's about us. And that, that means it's about to get pretty real for us. <laughs> right? Not only does he know the servants, but he knows their ability. He knows them intimately, and he gives to each according to their ability. So to the first, he gives five bags of gold. To the second, he gives two bags of gold. And to the last one, he gives one bag of gold. And, and before you start feeling bad for the one who got one, right? a talent or a bag of gold in Roman culture, that was the greatest unit of measurement when it came to money in their world. And one bag of gold was equal to more than a lifetime wage. So the one who only got one bag, he still got an awful lot, right? But here's the thing. None of the servants deserved the gold they got, right? It wasn't theirs. And none of them deserved it. They didn't go to the master and say, you know, master, you're going away. Will you entrust your wealth to us or will you entrust this gift to us? None of them deserved it and none of them asked for it. It is the work of the master who calls his servants and gives generously. The parable begins in grace. Because as you get to the end of the parable, you go, whoa, whoa, that's a little harsh. But the parable begins in grace in that each and every person God, according to their ability, they all belong to the Master. Their salvation was secure, but they were given gifts according to their ability to increase the wealth of the Master, to increase the kingdom. And all were given 
in abundance. It's fascinating to me that the parable doesn't go, well, the one who got two went, whoa, 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 that is not fair. That guy got five. Why did I only get two? When, how about that little schmuck? He only got one, right? That's not fair. The master gives according to ability. See, the truth of the matter is, this parable that begins in grace gives us a responsibility. Grace gives us a responsibility. The bag of gold equals the mission of God. The gift given to you is the mission of God through you. Dale Bruner says in his commentary on the book of Matthew that you're not saved from just from sin. It's not that you're just saved from sin, but that you're saved for service. I, and I think it's one of the deep problems in American Christianity. Our, our faith does not just deliver us out of a life of sin. And we're good to go. Wash our hands. We're, we're clean. Our faith and the grace that we received, the gift that we've been given, is a calling to use and invest for the kingdom. Which what becomes the great challenge of the church today, the great question that we have to wrestle with as Christians and those who claim to be servants of Jesus. What are we doing with the gifts that we've been given? How are we using the talents, the bags of gold, the great abundant wealth that the Father has given to us through Christ. It's not in comparison to the other servants, but only in what have I been given to be used for the glory and advancement of the kingdom of God. It's amazing to me as you read the parable, the one with five, the text says that he immediately went out and got to work. He sees the gift, he sees the bags of gold as a mission to increase the master's wealth. So it is. It, that immediacy seems like, too, like this excitement to join in the work that the master has given to him. And, and so it is with the second. This excitement to participate in kingdom work. But see, here's the thing. The master is wealthy enough, right? He doesn't need the servants to go out and do the work, but the giver expects work from those who have received. If I've entrusted this to you, I expect you to use it. And the first two servants joyfully participate in that. But we have this like pesky one, one bag servant, right? He acknowledges that he knows the master, or at least he thinks he knows the master. He acknowledges that the master is a hard man who reaps what he doesn't sow, who harvests what he doesn't plant. He claims to know the master. And it's that fear that drives him into protectionism. I can just hold on to this one bag of gold. I'll give it back to him. I can just maintain it and keep it. If I, if I can just hold it together, my master will be satisfied with me and call it faithfulness. If I can just give back what I had. See, here's the thing. Maintenance isn't mission. Maintenance isn't mission. And the bags of gold represent the mission of God. And the servant doesn't actually know the master. Because that's what he says, doesn't he? When he comes back with the one bag of gold. He says, you say you knew me. Well, then you should have put that in the bank. If you really knew me, you would know that the master is infinitely good. 
that he gives out of his graciousness and generosity, not because you're owed it or because you deserve it, but because he expects you to participate in the work of the kingdom. God is infinitely good. Infinitely full of grace. But for those of us who claim to be his servants, he expects something of the church. And it isn't maintenance. It isn't to just hold on to what we have and make sure we don't lose anything. It isn't to try to just keep it as it is. But it is to live joyfully and faithfully into the work and mission of God. It's fear that drives the man into protection. Fear of loss. Fear of the master. Fear of failure. The master didn't need more, and he knew it. And Bruner says that he veils his good theology. He veils his theology of God, the nature of the master, to veil his laziness. To know that the master doesn't need any more, which is fine, so I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and not worry about it. I won't use the gift that I've been given to invest in the kingdom because, well, Does God really need any more than he already has? And the irony of the parable, the grand irony of the story, is the one who tries to hold on to what he has ends up losing it all. The truth is we all want to be five Bags of gold servants, right? <laughs> At the very least, you want to be the two bag of gold servant. But I think deep down, I think deep down we all know, more often than not, we live like the one bag of gold. With the fear of loss and the fear of failure keeps us from taking the risk. But inherent to the church is risk-taking. The reward of hearing those those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I've entrusted you with little. And because you are faithful, I will give you much. You see, he had given them so much. He had given them so much in abundance. But that's the promise of the kingdom, isn't it? That whatever this life has to offer, the glorious kingdom of heaven is far, far greater. But it requires risk. It requires work. What have we done with what's been entrusted to us? What are we doing with the grace that's been given? God has given to us in abundance. Look around. We have this beautiful campus, this beautiful building that we've been blessed with and I don't think any of you were here when it was built, right? Maybe some of you were very little. But it's been entrusted to us. And our tendency is to protect it, to maintain it, rather than to fling open the doors for the mission of God in the world. God has blessed us in abundance with the generous gifts given to us. Do we see our budget as something that fuels the church so we can maintain our mission and our program and all the things that we do? Or do we see it as an investment in the kingdom of God, all that we have, that the kingdom may increase? Do we see the people that call this place home in their church? 
as things that we got to hold on to or people that we invest in that the kingdom may grow. The gifts that God gives to us are the mission that God has called us to. The kingdom might advance. We've got to be willing to take the risk to do the hard work of kingdom building. The irony of the one who tries to hold on, who loses it all, should be seared in the hearts of God's people. We all want to hear the words Well done, good and faithful servant. But we learn from this parable that only happens when we're willing to do the hard kingdom work that is expected of us. That God does not give to us so that we can hold on and maintain. God gives to us that we may participate in advancing the kingdom of God in the world. What are you doing? with the gifts you've been given. Let us not run in fear and bury them in the ground. And isn't that the irony? Digging a hole is a lot of work. (laughs) We might as well do the hard work of investing that gift for the glory of God. So that when it's all said and done, we may gain that invitation from the Father that says, come and share and your master's happiness. May we take the risk. May we do the hard work. May we be willing to use all that we are to be five bags of gold people willing to do the hard kingdom work. That the gospel might advance into the world. And may we return all that it is to the Master so that we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your Master's happiness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us now stand and affirm what we believe by stating the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, and dead and buried, he ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, Amen. I, uh, by the time I get to the end of the second service, I'm out of a voice, so sorry for the water drinking. But. Friends, as we go from this place, may we be reminded of the generosity of God's grace that's been poured out on us. Be willing to do the hard kingdom work. Maintenance is not mission. As we go from this place, may God be gracious unto you and make his face to shine upon you. And until we meet again, may he hold you in the palm of his hand as we go in the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of the Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May he be with you now and forevermore. Amen.